All right, in this video, we're gonna show you uh, what I think are some of the right ways that you should go about splitting your data into test, train, and validation, okay? And maybe not necessarily all the best practices yet, that'll be in our next video, but rather, why do we do it, right? What's the rationale for splitting things up, okay? Well, first and foremost, we split our data into train, test, and validation because we're trying to avoid this idea of p-hacking. Are you familiar with p-hacking? p-hacking is this idea, maybe you've heard of the p-value at all if you haven't heard of it. When you're trying to figure out whether you know something is, is related to an outcome, whether an independent variable is related to your dependent variable, right? In, in our linear models, for example. Uh, in the real world, this might be like, you know, if you're trying to figure out what's causing people to get sick with COVID, uh, you could say, well, is it because of you know, being overweight, you know, maybe that is your hypothesis is that being overweight seems to be an important value. You can test for it. You can test to see how important that parameter is on the outcome, right? And if your p-value is over a certain value, which, you know, we've sort of magically defined as 0 0.05, then that is a statistically significant parameter, right? But if it's less than that, then it's not statistically significant. In fact, here's this funny cartoon from XKCD where, you know, if you're up in this higher region, 0.01, you know, you're highly significant. Over here, you're significant. If you're right at the border of 0.05, you're probably not. Maybe you're at the edge. It's starting to look more like it's just significant, only if you look at it under certain subgroups or in different ways, it's not working. So to, one thing that people will do is called p-hacking. They'll try and hack this system to make it look like they're valuable. So again, let's come back here. Recall our linear models. The linear model says that you've got a dependent variable, y, right? Some sort of thing that you're predicting. It's equal to constants, a constant, right? Your, your y-intercept plus a parameter, which is tunable, multiplied by your independent variable. Well, imagine what could happen. What if this parameter went to zero? If when you tuned it, this thing went to zero, then that means that this independent parameter was not Actually, this independent variable was not uh, statistically significant. That's where this p-value comes from. Is essentially, what is the value of this parameter? If it's over 0.05, then we call it statistically significant. If it's less than, then it's probably not. It means that it was a, a feature which was in your model, but it wasn't an important feature. And so uh, more on feature weighting later when we get to ensembling and some other techniques. We'll show you how you can actually pull out, you know, what are these values? How important was something that came out of your composition-based feature vector versus something that came out of your structure-based feature vector. Can we compare which one is more important? Uh, yeah, we can. We can get feature weighting depending on which models we use, okay? But uh, for now, that, that's the idea of, of p-values. Um, and so p-hacking, what people will do to cheat this and sort of get around it, and you know, if they really want to convince themselves that an independent variable is statistically significant, they'll do this. They'll collect data, but the second that they have a p-value over the threshold, they'll just stop collecting data. Well, that doesn't make sense, because in the real world, what if you kept on collecting data, right? It might change. It might make it better. It might make it worse, right? They will analyze many measures, but report only those that have p greater. So sometimes they had a bunch of hypotheses, and let's say 9 out of the 10 of them resulted in p-values that were less than 0.05, but then they only report the one that did. Well, that's cheating, right? They will collect and analyze many conditions, but only report those that have a p value of point greater than 0.05. They will use covariates, so things that are correlated with one another. So maybe obesity is correlated with height, and really it's height is the reason why people get you know, uh, the disease or whatever. But they'll report obesity even though it's just correlated with height, right? So that's a problem. That, that's no good or they will exclude participants or transform their data. Anyways, these are all bad. You would never do any of these things. Let's break this into something maybe you can, that people can follow more simply. Imagine that I'm out here telling people, I'm magical, I have this telepathic ability, I can guess whatever number you're thinking between a number and one and five. And so I say, what number are you thinking? I, I think I know it, what number is it thinking? I say, is it four? And you say, no. And I'm like, okay, start up, start up, start up. Is it three? And you're like, no, that's not what I was thinking. I'm like, okay, start over, start over, start over. Is it two? And you're like, yeah, it was two. I'm like, look, I did it. My model did it. First try, boom. And you're like, no, 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 that wasn't the first try. You tried it several times and then you, you started over and you only reported the one time when you got it right. That's what some people do with machine learning. Um, and the way that they do that is by not understanding why they need to split their data correctly. So what do we mean by split up your data? When you 
to avoid p hacking, right, and to actually show whether or not your model is capable of making the predictions that we think it might be able to do, you have to have to have to have to have a test set. They call this the holdout method, right? Where basically you take some of your data, typically on the order of about 20%, 10 to 20% of your data, you hold it out and you only look at that data in your test set one time. I had a grad student who used to say that it is holy and sacred. You only get to touch it once, right? You don't get to build a model and see how it does on the test set. And if you didn't like how your model did, try again. Because that's b-hacking. That's cheating. So we only test it once. Now you train on the training data as long as you want. Train like crazy. In fact, something that's useful to do is cross-validation. You take this training data and you chop it up into folds, they call them, right? K folds, that would be X number of folds or some number of folds, so five fold or 10 fold cross validation. You chop this up into uh, segments and let's say you hold out one of them, you train it on the others or vice versa. You train on one of them while holding out the others, okay? And then you iterate through which one of those chunks gets held out and you keep on training it by hiding different sets of the data and training your model on the things that are left over and then you iterate through that a bunch of times. The goal is you're trying to make your model as robust as possible through this cross-validation step such that when it sees something new, which it's never seen before because it was in its held out test data set, it will do the best possible. But you only get to test it once. So during cross-validation, train your model like crazy. Change the number of parameters, introduce different features, do whatever you gotta do. But when you're ready to test this on the test set, you do that one time. Otherwise, it's p-hacking, okay? Um, and this is sort of the same thing, whether or not you have a validation set. Typically, they use a validation set if you're doing hyperparameter tuning. So if your model has parameters which are tunable, it can be different values, you can do that on your validation set, okay? Um, so what do I mean by that? So if you look at what sort of parameters might be important for you with your model, there's different ways to search for them. There's the grid search. Like let's say you're looking at um, a random forest. The number of trees in the random forest could be a variable, right? That's, that's part of your hyperparameters. You don't know if you should use 100 trees, 1,000 trees, just 50. Those are different values. So you could form a grid over all these different parameters. You could make a grid like a design of experiments where you try all of them. But that's actually less efficient, by the way, because you'll notice that if you've got this unimportant parameter and this important parameter, you had these three things all line up and you're testing the same thing. So you're missing the fact that there's actually a lower error of your model, whereas if you just chose random values for your grid search, and instead of grid search, if you did random search, you're more likely to find this best performance in your model. Well, more on that later when we talk about hyperparameter tuning. But the idea, again, here is that you tune your model like crazy, and as you train it, let's say that this is your training error. The error is going down because you're training it over time. Usually most models exhibit, this is called a learning curve, where you look at the model error as a function of how long you're training it or how many, you know, how, how much hyperparameter tuning you're doing. The test data set typically does something like this, where it also gets better until a point and then it starts to go up. So what's happening here is that as you train it longer and longer, your model is essentially memorizing the training data set. It, you've given it so long and so much time to focus on the training data that it's memorizing that. And then when you introduce something from the test set, which is outside of the training data, it starts to get it more wrong. So this is an example of overfitting, right? Where we're getting our bias wrong and we're increasing, we're, we're reducing our bias, but we're increasing our variance, just like I showed you in our previous video on linear models. So you wanna, you wanna avoid that. Now, another critical thing to talk about in materials informatics is how we go splitting up our data. We, it's good to have 10 to 20% of your data as test set, but how do you pick it? Do you pick it at random? And when you do your test, uh, your training data versus your validation data, do you pick that at random? That's what a lot of folks will do. You start with your original data and you just randomly pull out some fraction of it and call that your testing data. Well, that might work for some things, but in materials science, in materials informatics, it usually doesn't. And that's because often if you look at your data, you will find that it is highly what's called clustered. Whole another video coming later on clustering. But it essentially means that in your training data set, maybe you had a whole bunch of oxides, or maybe you had a whole bunch of steel alloys, or maybe you had a bunch of aluminum alloys. So really what you had was three different groups of materials which cluster together, and those are all really similar. 
So if you just randomly pull data out, then you're probably going to have members of those different groups present in your test set and your training set. So that's kind of like cheating. It's kind of like p-hacking because if there's, let's say if you're trying to predict like some metal alloy, right, some steels, you know, whatever, Dubai temperature, and you know what the Dubai temperatures are of all of these other steels that are almost identical to it, then what you have is really more of an ability to interpolate as opposed to extrapolate out to new compounds. Because let's say you build this model and it's awesome. Well, not surprising it's awesome because you left in all these materials in the same cluster to train from. Well, what will happen when now I try and predict a magnesium alloy? This magnesium alloy is significantly different compositionally than the aluminum or the steel or the oxides I trained off of. And so it's now a true what we call out of set example. It's something very different than our model seen before. Well, your model might have looked like it was going to be awesome, but it's probably going to bomb on that because it's never seen anything like it. So there's this really great paper by Meredig and coworkers where they essentially do leave one cluster out cross validation. As you're doing your cross validation, they essentially say like, what if you took like this whole cluster of materials and you don't let it train on anything in that cluster and you see how it does during cross validation. And then you do another one, you hide this cluster over here and you ask how well can we make the model learn to predict those things. And then you do the same thing over here. So by holding clusters out at a time, you do a much better job of this. So we have a really cool specific example of this coming in our next video, which happens to be on best practices for materials informatics. So for this one, there's a paper that we published. We think it's the definitive best practice guide for doing materials informatics. And it shows a really good example of why you can't just blow this off. So stay tuned for our next video.